Thank you. Thank you Uwe, for the nice introduction. My name is Martin Mulders. I work at a Dutch company called InfoSupport. We do a lot of consultancy, uh, and we do that by bringing in our own kind of awesomeness, which we call awesome sauce, hence the sticker on the Mac and on the screen. Um, one kind of technology that I find particularly awesome, and that I've been valuing more and more over the last years, is called React. And in the coming 45 minutes, I want to share with you why I think React is so amazing, what you can actually do with this. And I'm going to do that using a lot of coding examples, so please bear with me. If it doesn't go correctly the first time, please bear with me, but I guess we'll do fine. Let's get started. What is React? React is described as a library that lets you declaratively build a user interface using JavaScript and optionally XML. Now, what's interesting here is the word declaratively, because we're using React, you can actually declare what your user interface looks like instead of writing it out imperatively. And the word user interfaces is very important. React is really targeted at building user interfaces, but it does not say what kind of user interfaces. In this talk, we'll be looking at web applications, but there's spin-offs and forks of React for a lot of user interface platforms like desktop applications, mobile applications, and there's even a spin-off that lets you generate PDF files. It's kind of a read-only user interface, I guess, because, well, interacting with a PDF file is a bit hard. Uh, and we use XML for that. This is 2020. If you thought everything is done using JSON nowadays, well, not so much. We still use XML, and we'll see how that works. How does React compare to other web application libraries that are out there? There's a few things that make React different. First of all, React uses one-way data binding and not two-way data binding. Two-way data binding has become very popular with uh, kids like, for example, AngularJS back in the days, where you had a dynamic and automatic binding between your memory model on one hand and your document object model on the other hand, and AngularJS would keep those in sync, probably throwing an, uh, too many digest cycle exception at you if it couldn't do so. React uses another approach and says data just flows from top to bottom. It's one way direction. There's no custom templating language in React. Everything is done using XML and there's no post processing of your views whatsoever. Thirdly, React focuses on building user interfaces and th this means that there's a lot that does not come out of the box for you. Again, if you look at, for example, Angular, JS, or later versions of Angular, you would find modules for doing REST calls. You would find modules for interacting with your cookie jar. You would find modules for whatever you can think of. This is all not there in React. It's just a user interface and nothing else than that. But as we can see later, browsers have a rich uh, set of APIs nowadays that lets you do many common tasks. React applications are built using JavaScript and just JavaScript. We can add XML. This is called JSX, and we'll see in a few minutes what that is and how it works. But you can do without. By the way, I've never seen anyone doing it without JSX because your code will get very verbose. You can add TypeScript if you wish, which gives you type checking at, at compile time or build time if you wish. Very powerful, and especially if you're building larger applications, it's definitely worth considering to use TypeScript on top of JavaScript. And finally, React uses its own mental model of what your document object model looks like. It's called the virtual DOM, and that's, if all goes well, it's in sync with the actual DOM. And we'll see later how that synchronization process works. Before we dive into that, I want to show you a few tricks and things that are very popular in the JavaScript world nowadays. Because if, like me, you have a Java background and you look at JavaScript, you'll at first be like, oh yeah, I know this, this is how we did it with jQuery back in the days. Well, the JavaScript world has changed and there's a lot of powerful construct, constructs in the language that are also very popular in React and in the front-end community. So let's run through them real quick. First of all, JavaScript now has classes which wasn't the case like five or 10 years ago, maybe. Classes work basically like we expect them as Java developers. So we have a class that ha can, has, can have properties and it can have methods. And if I create an instance of that class by saying, hey, I have 
uh, a new instance of the amount class, 1500 Swedish Krones. I can invoke the get currency method on that. And as I expect, I get the currency back, not the other part of the object. And I can create many instances of classes and have them populated with different fields. And those methods can be simple gather methods like this, but can also contain more complex business logic. Secondly, there's functions. Functions aren't that special, are they? I mean, we all know functions, and this is just a JavaScript function checking whether a number is even or not. It's nothing special. I can invoke it. And the outcome is as I expected. But what you see happening a lot in the React ecosystem is that they use different syntaxes as well. For instance, the arrow function is very popular. In the arrow function, I have a, an argument list down there, followed by the fat arrow, and then followed by curly braces th that mark the function body. And inside the function body is just, as I expected, the same statements. And you can make it even shorter. You can make it even shorter by just removing the curly braces. If your function is really short, you don't need the return statement either. And you can just write it like this. You can like this or you cannot like this. My personal preference is I like this. I find it very short and concise. But if you feel like writing function fit is more of your, of your taste, you're perfectly good to go. It all works in a similar way at the end of the day. But just know that there's many ways in which functions are written. Next, next language construct is object decomposition. Imagine I have an object here, and I created it with a few properties. There's a name, there's an age, and there's an occupancy. I can actually deconstruct this object into the individual properties. So I can say, hey, just give me the name and the age. And at this point, I have two local variables in scope, name or age. But I don't have occupancy here, because I did not decompose that one. So this is a very intuitive way to pull out a few properties from an object and leave the rest alone. Same can be done with arrays. So I can have an array and I can say, okay, decompose that for me into some of the individual elements inside that array. I can ask, for instance, for the first element of the array or the second one. Again, this, is, this mechanism is, is used, uh, as we will see later, today for, uh, for instance, in some of the React hooks, where the hook is trying to return more than one return value, which is not allowed in JavaScript, but hey, why not? We can just return an array with the two values and then let the user decompose that into individual variables. This would actually be the same as if we did um, numbers, first position, second position. But you're not coding the indices, you're saying, hey, I want to have this um, this position. Then there's an the object shorthand notation, which is basically doing the other, the other way around. It's constructing new objects out of the individual properties. So I can say, I have a few local variables, name and age. Please construct me an, a, a simple object with just those two properties, and the values of those properties are equal to the variables that I have currently have in scope. And if I would inspect what that looks like, what that looks like, I can stringify that as if it, uh, using JSON, and it gives me an object with two properties and the values that I expected it to have. <coughs> then there's string interpolation. Very powerful, and I'm really hoping this someday will come to Java as well, because it is, in my experience, an easy way to construct strings altogether. Let's say that I have my account amount class that I showed a few seconds ago, and I want to have a nice textual representation of that. I could say, okay, first take the currency property, put a space, and then the amount itself. And then this gets combined into one single string and then returned as the return value of the two string method. This backtick, and the dollar curly braces syntax is there to tell, the Javas to tell JavaScript, hey, I'm going to construct a string using some variables that I have in scope. In this case, they're in scope because I refer to them using this. 
So this is all nice. It's not required to understand React. What we're going to tackle now is JSX. And JSX is, well, I would say highly recommended if you want to use React. As I said, you can do without, but it's just going to be a lot more typing from your side. And I don't know about you, but I am a kind of a lazy developer, so I prefer less over more typing. So what is JSX actually? JSX is an extension to JavaScript, and it lets you use variables that are whose value are XML. That's not a string containing XML. That is XML itself, just a, a, a structure of, of text, of elements, with attributes, with child elements. You can embed expressions in it, as we'll, we will see later, and you can add attributes to those elements. And you can actually have child elements, so there's nesting support. React gives you an automatic prevention against XSS attacks. So if there's any place where you have a, an, a variable with, for example, script, alert, whatever, and then close script, React will not automatically embed that into your web application, but it will escape that for you and make sure that it doesn't get run into the, web, into the user web browser. Of course, there's a way to circumvent that, and the syntax for that is so bizarre, I don't recall it from heart, and there's no way that you're doing that by accident because the syntax is so absurd, but it is there. JSX is a very, a very interesting technology, but the thing is, there's no browser nowadays that runs it out of the box for you. So you need a step in between to turn this JSX into plain old JavaScript without XML. And this process is called transpilation, which is transformation and compilation. It's neither of both, so let's just combine the two and, and think of a new word for that. And in the case of React, it means that a JSX element gets translated into an invocation of react.create element. We'll see later how that works. So let's look at some examples. I mentioned the word elements, and as I said, using JSX we can have XML as a first class citizen in our JavaScript code base. Here I'm declaring a variable called element, and what's inside the variable? Well, it's a div. It's, the, it's a div, the same thing that we can have in an HTML file and that will create a DOM element in our browser. I can start typing here, and we can see in the, in the yellow box below that it gets updated automatically. So this, this element, this div, is actually being run in the browser, but it, it's not a string, it's not interpreted, it's not whatever, it's automatically converted into real document object model elements. Well, that's so nice and good. I have this element. The second thing I need to do is I need to invoke the React DOM render method. React DOM is actually the binding of React to the document object model. As I said, there's multiple bindings. There's bindings for, for native applications, for desktop applications, so on and so forth. This one is there to specifically work with the document object model in your browser. The render method needs two, uh, two arguments. The first one is the thing that I'm going to render. In this case, it's an element. And the second thing is, a, is an actual element inside my existing DOM where the application is going to be mounted, so as to say. So I'm creating an application, but it needs a place to live somewhere in the web application, in, in the web page where my JavaScript has been loaded. And that's the second argument, document.getElement by ID. Now, as I said, JSX can have attributes. So for instance, I can just say, okay, my element has an identifier. You hardly ever do this in the React world, um, but you can do it if you want to. And you can specify mo more than just the ID attribute. But take care, because many attributes actually have a different name in JSX. For instance, if you have a div in your HTML file, you would say class is red text to apply a certain CSS rule. But that one won't work in JSX, because class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript, and this still is JavaScript after all. So it's named class name, camel-cased. And if I start typing here, we can verify that indeed 
it gets translated into the regular DOM thing called a class, which binds the CSS style red text to the element and applies it to the text that we are seeing here. Another thing is that they sometimes behave differently than what you're used to in the HTML world. For instance, the style attribute is there to, to, to uh, actually apply an inline style to your HTML file or to your HTML elements. In JavaScript, I can actually do this. In JSX, I can actually do this using an object instead of just a string. And in this case, I'm creating an object with two properties, color and font weight. Note that the font weight is also written differently than we're used to in CSS. In CSS, we would have written font dash weight, and here we're writing font weight camel cased. Again, this is because font dash weight would not be a valid JavaScript identifier for the property, so they needed a way to circumvent that. And if I start typing again, we will see that we have red text in a bold font. So the translation to how it's done in the browser is done for us by React. And we just need to, need to know and need to remember that sometimes both classes, uh, both uh, attributes and their values behave a little different than we're used to. The React documentation has a very uh, descriptive page about the actual differences between JSX and HTML. And if you start using React, it's worth checking that one out to see what other differences you may encounter. So. Another difference that we need to be aware of is the fact that a JSX expression or a variable with JSX in it must have a single root node. Just as our HTML files have an HTML opening and closing tag as the root of, of the whole document, the same holds for JSX. So I cannot just say, well, let's do uh, a div followed by another div. We get a an error message from Babel, it's actually very descriptive. It says adjacent JSX elements must be wrapped in an enclosing tag. So the most simple approach to do that is, well, let's put an enclosing tag around it. Now it works. But some purist may say, hey, you're creating a div here that you actually don't need. And well, you're more or less right. So we can replace that with react.fragment. like so, and react.fragment creates, well, it, it makes sure that it's syntactic, syntactically correct so it can be rendered, but at runtime, the surrounding div will be gone. It's not there anymore. So it's a little bit closer to our intention. And if you are really feeling fancy, you can actually remove the name react.fragment altogether and have an, a JSX element with no name. This is not valid XML, and that's why they have react.fragment as well, because that is valid XML, but you can do it like this, and it's still valid in the JSX world. Now we've seen elements, and they are basically just DOM elements. That's not yet very powerful. This is not where the magic of React really happens. Where React shines is that you can build components. Think of components as actually a function that gives you a React element in return, and that you can pass a few arguments. Those arguments are somehow named props in the React world. I don't know why, but they decided that elements have props instead of arguments. It's that way. You can give the method any name, you can give the method argument any name, but props is by far the most used. What we see here is that we create a function I'm using the arrow syntax. The function takes one argument called props, and it returns a sample snippet of JSX. One element here, it's a div again, because at the end of the day, it needs to be something that the browser is aware of. And it will just create this div with two child elements. The first one is high comma space, and the second one is a new text element with the value of the name property of that props argument. So this props argument is just an object we're getting, and if there's a name in it, we'll use that one. How do we specify it? Well, using an attribute. 
So we're saying, render this greeter component for me. And here is the arguments that I want to give it. There's one, it's named name, and the value is jfocus. Instead of using this props and typing props.name, we could have done, we could have used object decomposition as well. Note that in our arrow function, we got rid of the props. We just say we expect an object with a name property in it. And that means that our local variable is not named props anymore, but it's named name again. Fun uh, effectively, it does the same thing as the previous example. It's just a little bit more verbose in what it actually expects. I prefer it this way because I'm really, I'm really making clear with the function declaration already what kind of properties I expect from my component. So these are the basics of JSX, but JSX can do much more for us. As I've already shown you, you can have expressions in JSX. And this is a way to, to dynamically populate the, the document object model that will be outputted eventually. So here I have an example component. It's a function, it takes props. But if you don't have any props, you can actually leave the argument list empty. It's, it's no matter, it's the same thing. But well, let, let's just put it there for conciseness, like so. It builds a div. And inside that div is a strong, and inside that strong is our curly braces. And this is a place where I can literally type anything as long as it is a valid JavaScript expression. So I could just say 40 plus 2, and it will say 42, of course. JavaScript is a very powerful calculator at the end of the day. It's so powerful, it can even add numbers if they're text but you need to be aware of the fact that it's text. This is cool. You can also refer to variables that you have in scope. I have a variable answer to question of life. Let's look at that one. It's a valid JavaScript expression, so I can type it here. I can even do method invocations there. I put those braces, turning it into an invocation of the method named ask question of life, and of course, as we all know, the answer to that question is 42, and that outcome is then used as the value of the expression, and that's being used in my document object model that we see at the end of the page. If we can do expressions, we can also do control statements. Here, for instance, I can do a ternary operator. I have an emotion, a very emotional component. I can give it a property called is happy. And if that one's true, I want to clap my hands and otherwise it's time to dry my tears. So what I'm doing, I'm looking at this property here. I'm checking if it's true. If it's true, I'm returning the clap hands component. Otherwise, I'm returning the dry tears component. And this is a very easy way to make sm uh, small decisions inside your JSX. Have little things like, am I logged in? Show a user profile, else show a login button, that kind of stuff. Not only can I do conditionals, I can also do iteration. So for instance, if I have an array of ticker symbols, those are all Dutch companies, ASML, Heineken, you must be familiar with that one, I guess, uh, Royal Philips. I can create a list of ticker symbols, which basically takes the array of symbols that I'm passing and says for each element in that array, I want you to invoke a function I'm passing that function as an argument to you. And the outcome of all those function calls is giving me a new array. And that new array is then the outcome of my component. So it, it looks at HM, it's ASML, runs this function. It looks at HAIA, runs that function. Looks at PHIA, runs that function. And for each and every one of them, it will run, it will display the ticker component. And if I update that component, we see that all of them are actually being updated immediately. Very powerful. Now, 
if you're like me and you look at this, you may be thinking, that's all cool, but it feels a bit like magic. How does that work? I, for one, was very curious and decided to figure out what's happening under the hood, the stuff that we did not see. There's basically two things going on. The first thing is that at build time, some magic is happening already. We've written a few components in JavaScript files. We've wired them together using nesting, etc. But that's not all of it. When we build our application, we use Babel or the TypeScript compiler to actually strip the JSX away and replace that with invocations of react.createElement. So, for instance, if I have a component that's called greeter and I'm using that somewhere in my application, I'm passing it a, an argument called J, uh, with the value jfocus, then at build time, this is getting replaced with an invocation of react.createElement. The first argument is the, the component itself. The second argument is all the properties together in one object. And the third argument, null in this case, is any child components that I may have included, but there are none in this case, and that's why it's null. So, as you may, Im may imagine, this will give us a very large object structure because, well, at the start of the day, we have an application and that has a lot of child elements, and those have child elements, and grandchild elements, and grand grandchild elements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very large tree of components, all represented as a kind of an object. Because react.createElement is a function that returns us an object that kind of like describes what the document object model should look like. But mind you, it's not the document object model thing itself. It's a description. Now at runtime, this large tree of DOM-like objects is looked at by React, and then React compares that with the actual DOM. It starts looking at the second argument of the React DOM.render method. That's where my app is going to be mounted, right? And it looks at this large object tree in one hand. It looks at the actual DOM in the other hand, sees that it's basically empty, and starts performing changes to the actual DOM based on what it sees in the object structure. And now the, the powerful thing is, that React will only do the changes that are really necessary to perform. So if a part of this large object tree is a correct description of what the actual document object model looks like, it will not do anything. And this allows for a very high uh, runtime performance. This process is called reconciliation. It's, it's basically syncing this virtual document object model with the real document object model. And it works as long as you are aware of the two major assumptions that React does on your code base. The first assumption that React does is, hey, if you have two, two components, two elements with a different type, then whatever is under them, their subtree, will by definition be different. That's the first assumption. The second assumption is, if you have any child elements that are re-rendered in a list of similar type elements, then they do need a key prop that will help React identify the children. Let's look at this in more detail. First, there's the, hey, elements of a different type will return a different subtree. That's the first assumption. Say I have an application that takes two properties, a name and a language. And based on that language, it will include a greeter component that is aware of the language of the user. I'm passing SE, and my switch statement will return the Swedish greeter here, of course. This means that my document object model contains a diff with a text element for the hey. Let's do it this way. A div, a hey, that's the first child element, second child element, is text with the name, and then there's a Unicode flag, which is a bit hard to see in the code, but you see it down there in the output there. Now, if I change my language to, for instance, Dutch, because I'm Dutch after all, React will decide, hey, this Swedish greeter just got replaced with the Dutch greeter. 
That means that by definition, this div, hey, name, whatever, flags, is now obsolete and can be removed from the document object model. And instead, there's a new div with hello and the name and a flag, and that needs to be added to the DOM. So based on this different type, React can decide what is to be removed from the document object model and what is to be added. But all the other parts of the document object model, as I said, remain untouched. And the second assumption is about this key prop. This is basically the same example that I showed you like a couple of seconds ago, where we looked at the ticker list. But now, let's imagine that at runtime, somehow, my array gets mutated and uh, the, the beer company gets removed. Goodbye, Heineken. Now, how would React know which of those tickers needs to be removed? There's no way for React to see because they all have the same type. They're basically, as far as React is concerned, the same thing. There's just three of them. So what it will do if I don't guide React in any way, it will just remove all three of them and then re-add two. This is not very efficient, of course. For a small list with just three items, it doesn't really matter. But if your list contains a couple of hundreds of items, maybe, then this may hurt. And that's why React asks you in such a situation to, sp to give an additional property which is named key. And the key is a special property. You don't need to implement it somewhere in your component. See, my ticker doesn't know about the key. But the key is just an identification of that element. And the rules for a key are simple. They need to be unique. So for each symbol in my input, I need to have a unique key. Well, in this case, given the nature of my application, the ticker symbol itself is already unique, but it, this may not always be the, course, uh, the case. And the second thing is that it needs to be stable when re-rendering. So if this array changes, and I'm running my ticker list again with the symbols.map invocation, then this symbol, uh, this key needs to have the same value for every element that appeared in the previous render as well. So there's no way that you can use, for, a, for instance, a random number or so, but if your objects have an, uh, a unique identifier which comes from a database, or if they have um, uh, a property, uh, a, a value in this case that is by definition unique, then you're good to go and you can use that one. So this is all nice and good, and until now we have seen a lot of things that happen inside the browser. But typically, applications don't live only in the browser. That's where the user gets to interact with them. But oftentimes, we want to do something with the environment as well. We want to store some data that the user types. We want to react to things that the user does, because it's user interfaces after all. We might want to fetch data from a remote API. Let's look at how that works. As I said, this is all stuff that does not ship with React itself. So we're basically looking quickly at standardized APIs that browsers nowadays have to do these kind of things. The first thing that we can do is inside a component, we can store a little bit of state. React provides us with a mechanism to do that, by the way. So this is part of React. And it's basically saying, hey, I have my component, and my component uses a little bit of state. The initial value is zero. And remember when we discussed array decomposition, that's what I'm basically doing here. Use state gives us an array with two elements, and I want to have a name for the first and for the second element inside that array. The first element of the array is the actual value, the actual state right now, and the second one is a method that I can use to actually update that state. And in a few seconds, we will see how that works. And since I have a, lo a local variable with the counter in it, I can use that in an expression and display it to my user. But if we want to update the state, we need a way to react to events because that state is not going to update itself in some way. Reacting to events 
in React. Wow, that's a nice one. Reacting to events in React looks pretty much like you might be used to in the document object model, but it's subtly different again. First of all, event names are spelled a little bit different. Again, they're camel cased instead of all lowercase as you may have seen before. Second is we cannot have a function name as an event handler. We always need to provide the function itself. Third, an event handler is always bound to a component that takes care of handling the event. And unlike event handlers in the document object model, they cannot be global. Well, technically they could, but I would advise you not to do that. Keep your stuff isolated, you know? And finally, event handlers, when called, because an event fired, will receive a synthetic event. This synthetic event looks pretty much like a native browser event, except it works the same on all browsers, which is a major difference with event handling in the browser because who hasn't seen these event handlers that are like, well, if the user agent is Internet Explorer, I need to look here and else I need to look there. You don't need to do that if you're doing event handling in React. So how does that work? In this simple component, I have two buttons, and my buttons have an onClick property. The onClick property is a reference to the function, as I said. You don't pass the function name, you pass the function itself. So increase, there's a small typo there, increase is actually a function, and so is decrease. Well, the functions are empty at this moment. And I have the same line as I had a few seconds ago, where I say, hey, React, I want to use a little bit of state inside this component. There's the counter, its initial value is zero, and I have a function to increase, uh, to, to update the counter. So if my increase event fires, I want the increase callback to be called, and I can say counter plus one or counter minus one. And now if I would click my button, then the callback gets called and it will in turn invoke the set counter function and the set counter function will update the state and then my component re-renders and my state is updated to one. And if I cl click it a couple of times, it still gets updated and it also gets decreased if I click the minus button. So the state is managed by React, and React makes sure that if I update it, that the component will be re-rendered for me. And using the set counter function, I have a mechanism to actually do that. And that set counter is invoked from an event callback. I can do the same thing for input elements. For instance, I have an input of type text. There's an onChange callback, and it refers to the update name function. The update name function takes the event, the synthetic event, remember, looks at the target of that event, which is the input itself, and takes the value attribute of that and uses that to call set name. Set name is an updater function for a piece of state that initially has an empty string as value. And then there's a button, just like we saw on the previous example. The on click refers to a callback, and the callback will show uh, an alert. And I can use string interpolation here to actually construct a nice message. Stock home, almost there. And when I click the button, I'll zoom in a little bit, we see that we actually have a pop-up that refers to the name stored in the state of the component and used to construct this pop-up. This is all nice and good, but we still have data that only lives inside our application. What if we want to retrieve data from a remote API, for instance? That's a very common use case, isn't it? Well, again, there's no default component for that in React, but the good part is that every modern browser nowadays supports the fetch standard. So using fetch, we can actually do any kind of HTTP re request that we want, retrieve the data, process it, and then the only thing we need to implement ourselves after that is a component that actually calls that API and uses the data to do something useful. So using the fetch API isn't that hard. 
let's read it from bottom to top. It starts with invoking fetch itself. And in this case, I'm passing the URL as, a, as an argument. Fetch gives me a promise. And a promise is JavaScript's way to say, you know what? I promise that I give you a value, but I don't have it at my hands right now. So let me get back to that later. That promise can be either resolved or rejected. Resolved means, well, as I promised, promised you, here's the data. And rejected means, well, I know I promised you, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to make it. Um, sorry to disappoint you here. Now, the thing is, from a browser's perspective, a request is successful if you get any kind of data back. So even if you get a 401, an authorized, or a 404, no found, yeah, here's your data. So the first thing I do when I have a response is look at the response status. And if it's between 200 and 300, then I consider the request to be successful. Otherwise, I'm replacing the original promise with a rejected promise that just says, well, you did a request, but it failed. It failed with 401 or 500 or whatsoever. If that check succeeds, then I try to read the response and parse it as if it was JSON. Note that in this code, there's a lot of assumptions from my side on what the actual API will do. So I'm assuming it returns JSON. Well, I'm not assuming. I build it myself, so I know. Parsing it as JSON gives me a, uh, an object structure. And then finally, I'm looking at that object structure. And I will just, I'm just interested in the joke property that's inside the response. The next thing I know I need to make is a component that actually uses this. And doing a request from a component is always involving state. Because initially, I'm sending out the request, I'm waiting for the response. This can be milliseconds, it can be seconds. So I have a, be a, a little bit of state that just keeps track of the fact whether the request is still running or not. I'm using the state construct again use state, and I'm giving it an object saying, well, loading is currently true. Then I'm saying react. This component has a side effect. When it renders, there's a side effect that you need to fire, but don't block on it for rendering. And the side effect is basically invoke the fetch random joke function, which is marked async. That lets us do an await on a function that actually returns a promise. And if that promise resolves, I have a local variable called joke, and I can say stat state. I'm not loading anymore because my response is there. And here's the actual data that I was looking for. And as you can see, my API actually returned some data, and the data is now included in my component and displayed. There's a lot of jokes in that in them. In there, let's not go through all of them. So if you want to store data persistently in your browser, you cannot store it inside a component, because as soon as you reload the page or, re or you navigate away, it will be gone, because the component is gone. You can use local storage or session storage to circumvent that. Both of them conform to the web storage API. Again, this is a standard API in, in all modern browsers. And it basically lets you store string values, just that. This means that if you have objects or anything else, the best thing you can do is stringify them with json.stringify. And when you read them, do a json.parse, and then you have your object structure back. You can choose how long the data needs to be stored. If it's just for the browser session, you use session storage. If it's it needs to be there even when the browser crashes or restarts or your computer actually restarts, you can use local storage instead. Now, this is all nice and good. This was all uh, toy example, so as to say, run directly inside the browser. But what if you want to do serious application development, ship something to your customer? Well, I highly recommend that you install the React developer tools for either Firefox or Chrome. As far as I know, there's no extension for Edge or Internet Explorer. Don't know why. Um, this gives you a lot of additional debugging property uh, possibilities when you build your React applications. And it basically looks like this. It lets you look at your application from a component point of view instead of what your browser would normally do. Well, it's just JavaScript. 
and it lets you debug even when you have source code minification on and when you use TypeScript and you use JSX, then your browser would normally not understand that, but now it would. Testing your components can be done with just an enzyme, and it's basically a way to verify that your component has a specific behavior without running it in your browser itself. Let's look at that real quick. We have shallow uh, testing, which just tests the component itself, but nothing from the subtree. I'm rendering my component. This gives me a wrapper, and I can invoke the text method on that to inspect the actual outcome of the component. And there's also a way to, um, to verify that event handling works correctly. I can do that by asking the wrapper to look for a specific DOM element inside. In this case, it's an A element, and simulate the click event. And when I have done that, I can do an expectation on my mock to see if it has actually been called. This all comes to you. Uh, you, ca you can combine all of this yourself, but uh, I highly recommend to use the Create React app. This is a project also by Facebook, which is basically a combination of a lot of powerful tools that really make your life as a React developer easier. And it leverages existing tools like Webpack and Babel and ASLint and you know what all to actually give you as a developer a very good development experience. It even lets you reload the page automatically as soon as you update a source file. You install it using the npm i create react app and then you invoke it one time using create react app name of the application. If that all goes too fast, by the way, I'll share the, the slides afterwards, so don't worry. And there's basically three commands that you need to remember if you use Create React App. It's start when you start developing, it's built to create a production build with minimized source code, etc., and it's test to run your unit tests. Going one step further, you can even write your own hooks. We already saw a few hooks like use state and use effect. You can actually write your own hooks that are a combination of hooks that you take from React. So for instance, if we look at the component that lets us fetch random jokes from this remote API, I can have a custom hook. Its name must start with use, that's a convention. And it can use existing hooks like use state or use effect to basically combine behavior to create new behaviors. This is especially very powerful if you have remote APIs that your application works with on different places in your application. Then you can just create a hook and just use that hook whenever you need it. So, it's uh, time to wrap it up altogether. If you start using React, then there's a few things that I would advise you to take home with you. Use Create React App because it saves you a lot of headaches when constructing your own build environment. Start thinking of your application as a composition of components and try to target towards small components with just one single responsibility and think in a declarative way. If you're curious how that all works, here's a few useful links. Create React app, you can Google it or follow this link. And if you're interested where that really boring jokes came from, there's also a link to that API. I hope you enjoyed all this. Please rate the talk in the JFocus app and have a very good conference further on. Thank you. <laughs>